thank you so much um, um, for having me here tonight. Um, I am, and that I think became clear, an architect uh, by training that um, um, started uh, working on the interface between architectural design and engineering. And um, in many ways, the knowledge of materials and, and the technologies uh, would enable me to, to help um, to come those both sides come together. And the conversation on materials, um, I think, is key in, in this process of, of integrating um, skills and to come to one coordinated design. Now, um, so yeah, starting with materials. So really, in a, on a, in a fundamental way, architecture is, I think, is materialistic, right? It's about understanding what materials you need. It's procuring them, it's buying them, processing them, it's bringing them on site, it's assembling them so that they make sense as a, as a wall built up or roof built up. Um, and finally, they uh, create a space which is, which is valuable, which creates value which will make you feel comfortable, safe, which is beautiful, um, which can be used as a hotel or it's a, it's a, it's a house, it's a residential place or it's an office. Um, and I think in this, in this process, in looking at it from that angle, there are two transformation processes that are happening. First of all, the one of the materials itself, from its raw state um, through its different stages of processing, making it probably a more valuable component. But really, it is also about um, creating value of the building itself. So the more you put those materials in place, the more it becomes um, a system, you would um, uh, have a building which uh, presents a value for a specific user group or a specific um, context. And the more uh, you process those materials, the more confined they become and the more specific they become. And, it's, and, and it's, it strikes me that, you know, up to that point, there, there, there is a transformation process which adds value, comes to that point when everything clicks together. And then from there onwards, the notion is things are starting going downhill. So once everything is complete to the plan and to the design of the architect, and then the aging starts. And then, you know, materials are locked in their place you need to repair them, you need to maintain them. And somehow it feels like it's just one step away from those materials to become waste. And maybe it's just 10 years away or it's 15 years away. But um, somehow our thinking does not uh, extend from the traditional uh, understanding of delivering a design, completing a design and finishing it. And maybe that's got to do with, with the experience in our Western um, <coughs> in built environments where the speed of change is, is slow. I mean, you know, 90% of our cities are built. They are from the last century or even two centuries ago. We have a huge building stock which we need to maintain. Um, but the notion of change in, in our cities, in our environments, is not, is not big, I would say. Um, <coughs> Well, if you, if you go to the East Asian countries, um, and I guess we know Shanghai, or you know the story of Shanghai, which within only 20 years um, developed from a 3 million city into a 14 million city. Um, a huge change happening, um, obviously a huge transformation process, and that is symptomatic to many cities uh, in, in China or in, in those dynamic markets. And while, you know, that, that the notion of change doesn't bring a, a quality as such. Uh, the quality of build is, is pretty poor. Uh, again, uh, the thinking behind using those resources and reusing them is, is not really existent. But for sure there is a, a clarity that change is, is an important part of, of, of our built environment and that we need to design for that change. We need to design for those buildings to, to be able to change and to adapt. And that has got to do with the way we make buildings, we build buildings, and it's got to do with the materials we use and how we put them together. Um, <coughs> so, uh, also when we talk about architecture, when we talk about architectural critiques, if we uh, follow the architectural discussions in the media, uh, we will hardly hear stories on the making of. We will hardly hear stories on the specific concrete 
on the specific aggregate, where it's coming from, um, etc. I think you know things focus on the finished product. And if I would type in, as I did this morning, uh, your fantastic Rolex Learning Center, um, and I would uh, ask Google to bring me up the images that have been mostly asked for, you know, they're all images presenting the final product. So that's the Learning Center. There's very little information on the first glimpse on actually how this has come together, how it's been used, how it's been transforming in its lifetime already. And, and I think it's symptomatic also for our education, for architectural education, that somehow it always focuses on that deliverable point, when you as an architect provide a piece of art, which is perfect. Now it's just the way it has to be, and all has to be like that, and then um, <clears throat> we move on. And, and I guess, you know, as changes happen in our society more, more often, more quicker, also in, in our world, in our context, our cities change um, quite dramatically. Um, I think this idea of a building becoming a, a, a final state and being complete is something we need to question. Um, and we need to uh, uh, provide uh, a design which looks at the entire life cycle, obviously, of the building, but also understands the materials, the processes, the buildings behind it, in order to design for that change. I think that will become your uh, also part of your work in the future. <coughs> um, so I was mentioning you know, those scales of, of materials forming a building, uh, providing um, the city context, and all these three levels, change is happening on different speed. Um, in a city, these changes would be probably slower, and we uh, were talking this morning, uh, earlier on, we were talking about a project in Venice, where all the information about Venice has been um, <coughs> recorded in a digital model, and you can see and perceive the changes over time. Um, on, on a building scale, we would talk about a building of 30 or 50 years lifetime, and often in that um, amount of time, we would see little changes. And then on the material level, on the fit out and the finishes, um, we could um, a, maybe um, imagine that those materials and finishes would respond to the changes inside the room and the spaces to allow um, <coughs> to follow for, for, um, and to um, 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 implement um, architecture changes to, to provide a, a quality which is not constant, which is not static, but more dynamic. And that is more a, let's say, conceptual question of how that, how that could happen, that those materials become an agent of change. And <coughs> I'm just bringing up this image, which is the work of Elisa Evert. She is uh, graduated at the um, School of Arts in, in Berlin. And she calls her work uh, on, on urban surfaces. I'm not sure whether you can see it's a, it's a ceramic, but <coughs> it, it's, 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 it's a brittle, it's a transforming material somehow. It, it seems to change, it seems to leave imprints, it seems to react with its environment. And I think that that's an interesting perspective of how, how we could um, bring that in, into the uh, palette of our design of thinking about the materials and finishes of something which would be more responsive and reactive to what's actually happening inside the spaces. Uh, now that's pretty abstract and I, I guess I just wanted to set the scene um, and be a little bit um, thought provoking. When I look into this specific uh, context that we have today, <coughs> I just wanted to sketch out the situation. So traditionally we have you, someone, an architect, who is the author of the design, who will create a building, and that's of course a collaborative um, effort in, in the office. But first of all, in the competition stage, you win the competition with an idea, which of course brings in a lot of different aspects and qualities of, of architect, uh, architecture together. <coughs> but um, well, once you have um, won the job, um, <coughs> you will split it in different uh, packages. You will split it in different trades, whether, whether it's the building uh, services, whether it's facades or structures, building physics. You will get different consultants on board. You will get specialists and experts that start working through the design from their perspective, from their expertise. And from there on, this integrated design will start to disintegrate if it's not really well managed. And if you don't have multidisciplinary experts on board who really work on those interfaces of traits. 
And working for Arab, I would say that this is the, the, the value proposition that we, we would have, that we can offer this interdisciplinary um, design from really all, sort of all, of, all um, aspects and from all levels of expertise. But of course, <coughs> even within our uh, office and our teams, there would also be a friction between teams and you need to clarify those interfaces. Anyway, time is running, time is short. You know, this process of, of really creating a structured organism is pretty much um, systemized in terms of its solutions, in terms of its standards. Um, <coughs> it's, not a, it's not a great um, environment actually for really designing or innovating, I would say. Um, <coughs> and then once the, the design is complete, whether it's done with a contractor or not, you would go to the procurement uh, stage and you would um, get a contract on board, a general contractor, and they would subcontract parts of the package again to those specialist contractors, whether it's facades or structures. And again, same thing happens, needing to bring that inside, integrating into one holistic design. It's difficult, <coughs> I would say. There's a different angle, I guess, and a different approach. If you would start really from, from the materials and you would start thinking about um, uh, units, logic units that are presenting a system that can adjust, that can um, um, change according to the specific context of a, of a project. So thinking about those logic units, uh, uh, integrating them into a system which is composed of all different layers, but it's, it's, a, um, um, it's a system which you can then integrate into a building on different levels. Uh, that would allow you, I guess, to have a bit more time to getting that really right, that, that system, um, more as a, thinking it more as a product, uh, product development, getting all the stakeholders on board, maybe getting an investor on board, because also there are different business models behind that will allow you to have more time, I guess, to, um, to work it through. You would start prototyping, would start um, having time to really test it with the users, uh, um, put it in a context where you really know it, it works, um, due to the um, digital technologies that we have, this, this logic unit could be much more generative. So it's set on an element of parameters that could change according to the project and according to the client. Allowing you to use it in different ways, looking completely different, but still based on the same idea of that system. And as I mentioned before, you know, following that approach, that, that's suddenly a completely different business model for the industry. No, it's not just one building, one building, one building. It's more similar to, to the approach of the, of the big uh, OEMs and the automotive factories that would start working on the platform, which has a set of a logic in, built within the framework. And you change the color, you change the chassis, you change some of the motor elements. It looks completely different, but it's all based on the same, same platform. Um, and with that, you can scale it up. And I think with that, you could overcome the fragmentation of the industry. And, and I think if we talk about innovation, um, this fragmentation of you know, lots of different players and lots of different fields is one part of really hindering our industry to transform and to change. And maybe we can discuss that afterwards. Um, <coughs> so having the sort of more creative technologist looking at buildings technologies on one hand and the, and the designer, the architect working hand in hand, I think that would be a fantastic model. And, and we try to implement that in the projects uh, well, I'm working on, <coughs> and it's coming down to that understanding. Who's seen that diagram before? It's a diagram published by Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and it's uh, the butterfly diagram. Uh, it looks at material cycles, and in the traditional sense, we would look at materials, and coming back to my introduction, where you start from the raw materials, you add by, you, you process them, you use them, and you take them away, you disuse them, and you, in a linear way, uh, they become waste. And the, the fundamental idea here is that wherever you are in that sort of cascade, uh, there is always a way going up to a higher level. So to recreate value, to keep value in the materials, uh, to remanufacture components into a system, well, to recycle them, that, that's um, one of the outer um, circles, reuse, remanufacture, recycle. And in, to allow that, we would need to integrate that sort of thinking, the way we use materials and we, the way we design systems. Now, I don't have answers for all these questions. Um, I 
can uh, show you a number of projects I've done together with the industry um, to look at system innovations in mostly in the context of facades where we followed through that collaborative process and we're always trying to think of, of what we compose more as a generative design. Uh, and I would go through different materials, I guess, um, and, and show a little bit the different angles. Starting with glass, which is, makes sense, having seen your bench and having heard the, the great introduction um, before, um, earlier on. So this is also where I started my career with a PhD. Um, glass, if you have witnessed its production, is, is a fascinating um, material because on one end you get the hoppers with, with sand um, and, and calcium and then as it's heated up um, it becomes um, a liquid transparent mass which is then floated on a, on a, on a um, zinc bath and because its density being um, uh, less than that of uh, zinc, it starts floating on that um, hot zinc, it becomes absolutely immaculate. And, and with that you produce a um, sort of infinite ribbon of glass, uh, which is sort of 3 meter 20s long and you start chopping it at the end once it's cooled down. So this is the float glass process, which was invented in the 50s by, by Pilkington and still, um, well, still the technology we use for mass production today. Um, <clears throat> now, when I started the, um, the, the leading and the, the, uh, directing the glass course in Aachen, um, you know, that, that material of glass, which, which has that um, sort of um, intuitive uh, respect for that um, glass, because it's brittle, it can break, um, we started to developing a series of workshops where we really tried to find out what are the fundamentals, the properties of the material, that would al allow a creative design finding process with the material. So it's flat, it's brittle, um, meaning that uh, being exposed to tension, it, it would break spontaneously and it could scatter, it could hurt some people. And similar to, to your project, uh, Jagoda, it's about keeping the glass in compression and trying to overcome that brittleness and, and, and really make use of that potential of being a very, very strong material when exposed to compression. Um, fixing of glass is always an issue because the, um, the homogeneous introduction of forces into the edge of the glass um, has to be fully controlled in order to avoid locked-in stress, to avoid um, stress concentrations, and with that, the risk of breakage. And this, one of those projects we did at that time was to look at a modular system where we are creating an arch um, based on the model of the tetrahedron, which is composed of four triangles and the, and the uh, mm, top chord um, panel, creating that spatial structure, um, with the diagonals, in fact, being the edges of two neighboring glass panels being bonded together, um, and in that way um, making, creating a very stiff structure, but also moving away from the notion of the more you use glass structures, the more transparent structures become. There's this abstract idea of um, using glass structurally to increase transparency and obviously the more reflective surfaces you would use and the more you arrange them to stabilize themselves, to stiffen themselves, the more reflections you would catch. But maybe that is the architectural language which is inherent in that material. And it's quite beautiful because you would see the change happening. Uh, it would catch the changing light conditions over the day, over the year. And it becomes a very, very much, not an abstract, but a, a subtle um, um, and, and, um, and central uh, use of glass. Um, so this is just uh, falling through some of the process. And this glass arch is now about 18 years. It's still holding up nicely. Um, and then the glass that we ordered uh, wrong, um, <coughs> we used then for a tensegrity structure in, in, a, in the architectural installation, making use of that, that uh, material. We worked on some uh, glass timber um, uh, systems or staircase where everything basically is locked together in a mechanical level, so it allows you to reconfigure and rebuild um, the system. 
Um, another example on that um, chapter of glass structures where we used again a, a boat construction to in order to initiate those compression forces. And in, that, in this example, the pre-stress wasn't introduced by, by pre-stressing cables um, running along the top cord, but by a series of textiles which grab into those joints and then um, um, through a, a cable alongside here is introducing a homogeneous compression load or um, a, a circular force which then in consequence creates compression force on the radial um, is, is, uh, was our approach and the, the structural elements needed were not just structural elements but they were actually elements to control the indoor climate providing um, some uh, shading and also glare protection. So uh, using more a tectonic approach to, to using compressive plates and tensile fabrics to form a combination which is not just structurally uh, using materials in the way they want to be used but also creating a new arrangement having a spatial quality. Well we saw a bench and th this is why I wanted to also quickly show the bench that I've been involved in when I was based in London it's probably um, yeah, more than 10 years ago. Um, a a um, um, furniture which is a five seat bench um, resting on this asymmetric um, steel column in the middle. We have 2 meter 50 one side, no, 2 meter 20 one side, 1 meter 50 the other. Um, and we have that glass block and we have that, that decent, uh, asymmetric support needing to cope with that um, bending moment. And we want to run through a similar exercise than, than you uh, in your team. Uh, looking at how to stabilize this stack of glass uh, through compression so it would stay in place. And it was presented some years ago um, together with Seele, who were the um, specially, uh, specialist contractors um, partnering with us. And what we see here is really a dry stack of glass. It's, it's a kneeled glass. It's just contour cut glass and you just clamp it together with a relatively high force in order to make sure that the joints are not opening up and all surfaces are under continuous compression. And this is done with these three pre-stress cables of a very high grade um, <coughs> metal to introduce those um, pre-stress forces. And we did a number of tests on uh, introducing interlayer materials uh, or using tempered glass and in, it was clear that uh, any sort of interlayer material you would traditionally use between glass would um, decrease its load bearing capacity as the controlled way and floating forces through that stack would be dependent on its plastic deformation. So we just basically have a dry stack of glass, you can unbolt the nuts and you can take the entire structure apart. So while we find solutions to develop systems that uh, allows a flexibility in you know, size and reusing elements, talking about insulating glass units we, uh, is, is, a, is a bigger challenge because we have multiple layers which are um, um, containing a cavity which uh, is sealed in order to um, decrease the amount of heat energy that is um, transmitting through the, through the, through the glass. Um, and in generally those seals have a lifetime of 25, 30 years and once those seals are broken these insulating glass units would start to fog up, they would become, they would, you, condensation would appear and this panel would um, become scrap. Now on the Empire State Building um, the, all the, the entire glass was replaced a couple of years ago and it was a double glazed unit and there was an effort to increase the energy efficiency and those units were cut open, they were cleaned um, and uh, an additional um, interlayer, a heat mirror was integrated and was sealed again all on site. So all the panels were reused, um, all the glass, I think 98% of the glass 
was reused. And that was possible just through scale, because there was the scale of that building with that, I think, 6,000 units. You could set up that process on site and to save the material and have a very um, and reduce waste um, to a maximum. I like those ideas and those stories because they, they bring you and they make you think of how our um, buildings could change in a more organic way. Right, we're coming to glass fiber reinforced um, polymers, and I have two projects I think to show. Um, this one is a traveling pavilion, or it was also called Mobile Arts, commissioned by Chanel. Um, it was a direct commission, I think, to Zaha Hadid, uh, who were the, uh, the lead architects, and we were consultants. Um, and I was leading the facade design on the Chanel Pavilion. Uh, when we talk about GFRP, we talk about big elements, big components, which can be molded in geometry and can be cured um, as a wind blade for a rotor or a sailing yacht. So we have really large-scale monolithic elements. Uh, um, with the um, Chanel Travelling Pavilion was an uh, art space which uh, traveled f um, was supposed to travel from one major city to the next and it started and kicked off in Hong Kong obviously um, and it all had to fit in containers so I think it was roughly 40 meters radius in no 40 meters diameter in one direction maybe 25 in the other um, leading to the segmented approach with radial joint lines making sure that the biggest panel is not bigger than 2,50 meter 50 fitting in a sea container, in a standard sea container. Um, it's GFRP, we see the high gloss finish, which was a key to the architect's intent of those panels mirroring the, the city silhouette and the context. Um, and it's, well, the, the fluidity of shape, I guess, is, is, um, is well achieved with that material. It's a relatively heavy material. It's a pretty stiff material. In that, ca in that sense here, it's, it's, it's only used for providing the outer shelter. And behind that, there are different layers of insulated blankets and membranes to provide that comfort inside. Um, and for some parts, um, yeah, you see the steel structure, which is quite heavy had to um, accommodate seismic forces for some parts of the locations um, driving really the structure design. And um, it was assembled in Yorkshire in UK and due to the really tight uh, time frame also some elements had to be flown in. So on one hand it's a good example of you know it's really this building is, is a system because all um, elements can be taken apart and they can be reused, and it was reused, uh, it was designed to be reused 10 times. Um, you all pack it up, you pack it in containers, you know exactly how many containers you need, you bring it up, and there's an IKEA manual, and you can build it within a week. Uh, you need, uh, let's say, three trained um, um, uh, labor forces, and then, you know, an army of unskilled labor, but, uh, so there, there was a real sort of methodology behind it. And in that sense, it's an interesting building because it was re reduplicated in, in different contexts, being just one building. Uh, the final um, show was at Paris, at the Institut du Monde Arab. But we, we, we have uh, panels which are um, poly, polymer-based, which you know, can take no other shape than exactly this shape. So once the final exhibition was over, all these panels now they, well, they live in containers, but th this material really is bound in that panel. It, it, you can never release it again. You can burn it, of course, um, or you can scrap it and, and use it as an aggregate in other panels. But, um, and then you had all the steel specifically made, which of course you could reuse. But it was a very material intense um, design. Um, and that, um, I will come to, to another material later on um, and provide another sort of approach of using GFRP and using biocomposites and using really natural materials um, with a similar effect. Now, look, now we look at protrusions. Protrusions are much more made in an automated way, similar to an extrusion of aluminium 
which you push through a die, a protrusion you would guess from the name, you pull through a die, um, and you um, net or wet the, the fibers with, with the polymer, and you can uh, shape it into profiles, just, just like any profile, basically. Making sure that the glass fibers that you use are really placed where you need them. So you can engineer your components, you can engineer your mechanical properties from component to component, which makes it very interesting. Um, similar to the natural um, sort of skeletons of, of, um, of ocean, um, uh, simple ocean organisms that, that form a skeleton uh, of similar of glass fibers, uh, um, um, concentrating the material where, where you need the material to be. So here we started developing a unitized facade system about overcoming sort of traditional aluminium systems which are in place for 50, 60 years uh, but looking at the material which does not need to have a thermal break. Aluminium is a fantastic um, um, mm, transfers heat uh, from inside to outside. This is why every mullion that you see um, would have a thermal break in order to stop that loss from uh, energy from inside to outside. So here the idea was if we had that, that uh, thermal uh, break material, why not forming the entire panel of that material, which has a very low thermal conductivity, um, and, and make big chunk protrusions, which you then combine to form a panel. Um, so this is, uh, I don't know, a standard aluminum uh, unitized panel, how many components would there be? I mean, there, there, there are um, dozens of different profiles, of different elements. They all are uh, processed in a different way that you combine them and so on. And here the idea was really to have a simple set, seven different protrusions that you would um, uh, bond together to form a panel, which is 10 centimeters deep. Um, and that thickness is the structural thickness of the panel, but also the thickness of insulation. So you use high performance insulation and you do not distinguish between a framing and an infill, but the whole panel becomes a structural integral part of the facade. Um, well, running through with, with uh, fiber line and permastilisa, and now I need to do something. Uh, skip. I skip. Yeah, Here we go, and we're starting from the beginning, sorry. <laughs> oh. ah, here we go. An image of the one-to-one -one prototype. So whenever we engage in a system uh, development with, with contractors, of course, the first prototype, the first visual prototype is key in that process. Um, now, more recently, we worked with a firm called um, uh, actual, it's a spin-off or a startup uh, in, based in Amsterdam, and they developed a system to print the mm, joints in the floor, uh, on-site or off-site, and they would use a terra, um, terrazzo infill to in between those joints. So it's sort of turning it the other way around, and uh, because these joints are printed. Um, with a, uh, in a robotic device, you have complete freedom of space, uh, of design and flexibility um, to adapt to uh, any sort of uh, condition on site. An interesting development of how digital technologies enable that customization process. And again, it comes down to the materials and to the, to the biopolymers that are used and the terrazzos that are used in what way they are made of um, recycled construction waste. And now coming to biocomposites, which are similar to glass fiber reinforced plastics. So we have fibrous materials and we have a matrix, a resin that binds the fibers together. Uh, but rather than using glass fibers and using polymer resins, we use natural materials. We use natural uh, fibers, flux, jute or hemp, and we use natural resins, which are more difficult to process um, but um, we, used, we used resins from chestnuts and um, the most, and they're biopolymers, obviously, 
the most promising also in terms of its performance are furane resins, which are um, uh, processed from sugarcane waste. We collaborated with uh, GXN architects in Copenhagen to develop a design of a unitized panel um, in that faceted geometry and the, the geometry expands from, from the panel over the entire surface of the facade. So this, uh, this notion of segmented individual panels I think is, is counteracted by, by the, continuous, uh, by the continu continuity of lines across the joints. And also we work with that overhang over the window that can be adjusted uh, depending on the location of the building and the orientation of the facade to minimize the solar gain. Which means that every panel and every, at every location it could be different in its um, geometry. Now the last slide, I guess, was this one. Um, looking at the initial design concept using those unitized panels uh, based on biocomposite materials. Basically with a similar performance but um, uh, with a, a greatly reduced embodied energy um, as these materials have um, are, are grown and regenerative materials that are available and uh, renewable. <coughs> um, the build up of the panel, uh, making of small scale prototypes just um, before um, producing larger scales in order to understand properties of the material and its application. And finally the one-to-one -one at the Trade Fair in London. Uh, similar to this uh, unitized panel, we started working on rain screen facade panels um, and use profiles again in a similar way to the protrusion, a stiffness behind um, a, a panel uh, in that way really creating large size panels which are very flat and stiff. From, uh, from these materials uh, where you can see the brown color, this is the furin resin that I mentioned which is derived from the sugarcane, the bagasse, which is the fibrous material um, from the sugarcane plant. Now this is a very sophisticated project um, looking at some uh, sophisticated chemistry to derive those um, natural resins. Um, but tucking into the natural cycles and using, um, let's say, agricultural waste materials for the construction sector is an interesting one. And we have one project now on site where we collaborate with TAM Associati from um, um, Venice. Uh, we're very engaged in working in, um, in Africa and other developing countries to um, set a suite of materials which are derived from locally available materials and waste materials such as fiber or shell materials and, um, <coughs> and we are now um, setting up a design manual how you can mix those materials into more traditional, um, with more traditional materials to create bricks, panels and insulation materials. Um, I don't know whether you're aware, but of course the uh, growth rate <coughs> in, in some African countries is, in, um, is enormous. And in many cases, Chinese contractors will take over those, those um, pr um, operations, importing relatively cheap materials, um, synthetic materials like foam materials for insulation, which in, in a relatively short amount of time will become um, waste. And there are no processes in place to collect this waste and to recycle it. So we're facing another issue here, I think, and it's the right time um, to make use of those materials. Now, finally, a project which has been completed just last year in Berlin, it's called the Futurium. It's made of um, aluminium panels um, and it's a rain screen facade. When we talk about the facade, we talk about its glazing percentage going down from a fully glazed envelope, maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Since then, the energy regulations calling for a higher and higher energy efficiency has made the glazing percentage shrink. And on a conventional office building, you know, it would be maybe 40%. So we now have 60% of facade areas 
where the architects ask themselves, what do I do with that? Um, <coughs> and uh, of course, that's another canvas to um, express um, uh, the conceptual idea of the building, but in a much different way than using glass and transparent materials. So there is a trend towards those rain screen facades to become more and more design driven in terms of the choice of materials, of geometry, um, even moving more into a free form geometry, but still making it in a panelized way. And for um, a German system supplier, we went through a number of studies to elaborate potential systems for these rain screen facades made with uh, panels allowing different geometries. Um, in the co-design or the, uh, with the architectural design of Andreas Fuchs. And so this is sort of a, um, an intro to the project, the Futurium. It's a sort of convention exhibition center in Berlin. And the glazing percentage or the, the elements where you really need a daylight, so there's some office spaces, is around 20%. But still the idea of the building is that it, it's completely continuously wrapped with the facade and you cannot really distinguish you know, different areas, whether it's an insulated facade, it's an overhanging facade, it's, um, it's a rain screen facade, so meaning it's cold and ventilated. So we developed the facade system which, which allows all these functionalities to integrate in a seamless way in this faceted, um, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the way to develop a cassette which can adjust its, its performance, uh, whether it uh, needs to be insulating, transparent, or it's um, an uh, opaque element. The outer um, element is glass in all, all cases and uh, together with um, or based on the design of Richter Musikowski, who are the architects, we developed uh, a panel which is only 70 by 70 centimeters. It's a relatively small scale element. Um, looking at the trends and facades is usually going to bigger, bigger, bigger. But the bigger you are, the less modular you would be and the less flexible you are. So now we, we had a facade area, I think, of... Um, um, but we had 8,000 panels in, in the end. Um, so it's 4,000 square meters of, of facade area. Uh, and we had 8,000 units, which means that here you can implement a real product um, design. And each, pro each element, the cassette, uh, we had time to develop it really thoroughly uh, as, a, as a kit of parts, which uh, was composed of the outer glass layer um, and then a reflector <coughs> on the back, which was a metal tray where you would have those <coughs> insulated areas behind and the metal reflector would then um, throw back some of the light <coughs> um, that, that is captured by the reflector. So these are these areas. And you see <coughs> in other cases you have see-through areas, so these are just ordinary windows. And in other instances those windows can even be opened. <coughs> So having all these different elements um, seamlessly integrated in that casseted system, I think it <coughs> was a very interesting approach and it allowed us to um, work with a quantity of scale which is usually not the case in a standard building. Um, going through some of the steps that um, the architects went from small scale prototypes, one to one, together with industry, a bigger element wanted to finally the prototype presented to the, to the ministry of, um, to the state ministry in order to, to sign off the design. And you see the or original design of the seamlessly um, 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 tiled facade. <coughs> and um, another um, uh, follow-up project. Um, so the project I showed you obviously was the winning project of a competition and then a follow-up was this, this design by um, uh, Ferdinand Ludwig who is now a professor for building botanics in Munich um, suggesting a facade which would grow over time um, which has external structural elements which are, um, which are trees which would become an external grid over time providing shelter and so on. Um, interesting um, uh, concept, I would think. Um, 
obviously with the challenge that these higher plants grow relatively um, uh, slowly. Um, anyway, the idea that the facade would change over time and that the change becomes the ruling idea of a facade, I think is interesting because it opens up and questions the perception that once you've designed something, you've designed it for all uh, future cases and only with a big um, effort you would be able to change that design again. Which is, I think, um, no, it's, it's speculative. Any, any architectural project is speculative because you will not know what will happen internally and externally. And you, what you need to provide is a building that can adjust. And here I think this idea was taken to, to an extreme. Um, but it's interesting uh, that we see the implementation of natural systems, of growing systems in, in, in the facade for good reason. Because what we want to do with the facade is not just it's losing less energy or it's performing better and it has a smaller footprint, but we want the facade to positively contribute to the environment. Not just to be less bad, but to be really good. Um, and this comes back to the um, um, to the idea of ecosystem services. So any material could contribute to the environment. So it does not release CO2, it captures CO2, for example. And, um, and that property have all living systems as they capture carbon. Um, and some of them purify the air, they will mitigate the heat, they will provide some microclimate which is beneficial, which allows to reduce the ventilation, which allows to reduce the, the heat cost without any sort of um, energy consumption other than the natural light that is consumed by photosynthesis. So we're starting to develop systems to, to enable the use of vegetation on, on facade systems. This is a modular system um, based on the design of Alistair Law, uh, where it's a really thin substrate a very thin panel with this aluminium foam as an outer uh, cladding panel uh, made of recycled aluminium and the uh, open foam allows the, the seeds which are in the substrate mat behind to grow through and in a relatively short amount of time really populate um, um, and transform the panel from being an aluminium panel to a heavily vegetated green panel <coughs> over a course of 16 weeks. Again, I like the idea that the facade is making something visible. Now, it's, it's becoming green, obviously, uh, in the vegetational phase where you have lots of daylight and the right temperature and would start slowing down um, uh, and die and then become another cycle. And, and the, um, well, this system allows for these cycles to happen in a controlled way. Another interesting um, idea is to, to take it even to another extreme and not just have to have panels, but to have fabrics and to have the seeds and nutritions embedded in a fabric, which you would use for a normal building site to shield off from, um, from any debris or from any um, 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 yeah, smoke or um, however you call it. And rather than just using a plastic membrane, you would use a vegetational membrane that again, over the course of the construction phase, would turn green. As you've seen here with this project in London. Um, bring me to the final project, uh, which you have mentioned in your introduction, the BAQ project in Hamburg, where we were looking into integrating those natural processes in a much more sophisticated way. <laughs> so rather than putting, adding, a layer of vegetation to the outside is integrating the processes, the underlying processes of photosynthesis into the technical systems of, of the project. So this is um, a competition which we um, were invited to by Spitterwerk Architects in Austria, uh, which we won and which we then um, led uh, in terms of the facade design all the way through to completion from finding the partners, finding the, the funding um, and setting up an industry consortium to develop this bold idea of an algae facade into a real system. So this is the finished, um, this is the building as it would look today. Mm, it's got four stories of these photobioreactor panels 
that are mounted um, as a story high panel on the outside as an external system to the residential building. And here you would have a close up and I just wonder whether this video is working. Oh yes, perfect. So this is um, <coughs> the algae photobioreactor. It's a more or less an aquarium, if you want. It's a, it's a multi-glazed unit. It's not filled with gas, but it's filled with water, with the, with the medium where the algae are circulating through, um, capturing the carbon um, and capturing the daylight um, from from the uh, well from the environment in order to. Um, perform photosynthesis and um, grow. And we have um, a grow rate of about um, doubling biomass in around seven hours. So every seven hours a cell would split and that way double the biomass captured and, and generated by the panel. And we're talking about microalgae, which are small organisms and very effectively uh, capturing carbon and, and performing photosynthesis. And there are different functionalities to this. Um, so the, um, what is uh, absorbed by the panel is in the spectrum of the visible light, but it can only be absorbed to a certain extent. Um, and the rest of the energy would start heating up the, the reactor or the medium, the water. Uh, as a, any solar thermal collector would do. So we only, not only generate the biomass, but also solar thermal heat as a, as a thermal collector, which we are then harvesting and integrating into the heat management system of, of the building. Now these are the little, the little ones, that um, the chlorella, which is a local strain of Hamburg, uh, very much adapted to the local climate over uh, millions of years a very robust strain, which uh, you can um, perfectly use in that environment. Then there are more valuable strains as spirulina, which would need a closer processing in order to maintain the right temperature levels and right nutrition levels for this strain to grow at the facade. Uh, certainly um, what we are uh, looking at is we want to really create a business model around producing algae in a decentralized way and selling it to the pharmaceutical or the food industry. A quick sketch of the building service systems behind. Um, I'm sure there, there are some questions, some close-ups of the system itself. We're working on the second generation, which are, I think, less constrained um, by this relatively heavy framing, uh, using a bonded uh, technology, being able to expand the size of the panels, making them thinner and lighter and being able to integrate in the primary skin of the building. Interesting technical challenges here to, to work with those, um, with the hydrostatic pressure of the glass inside the unit, which are generating quite considerable forces in the glass. Um, and also the sort of dynamic forces of introducing pressurized air at the bottom, um, uh, which is a dynamic load applied to the glass. Apart from all the issues of, of sealing the panel and, and making sure that the algae do not um, <coughs> die in, the, in, in that panel, but are continuously floating around and, and being active. This is the harvest in Hamburg. It's about six kilos a day on a good day, um, which is uh, rich of vitamins and amino acids. So that's a resource um, which can be turned into, into products. And I think the interesting bit here is that the facade really becomes a, an active part converting material streams or flows. So we have the carbon which is captured and turned into biomass. We have heat which is generated and can be distributed in the district. Um, in, a, um, in a different scenario, we can use the, uh, the mineral uh, leftovers of, of yellow water you know, to feed the, the algae. So this allows a number of closed-loop systems which are not just uh, restrained by the individual building 
but would allow an implementation on, on the district scale to really understand a building part of an organism which is part of a district and the district is part of a city and all these elements would be connected and exchange whatever they produce in abundance that another member in the district or another building would use at that time. So we're talking about different typologies which are complementary and form a certain symbiosis in order to work effectively as a team, a team of buildings. Here we have the, um, the, the, the swimming pool which provides, has to provide hot water all year round, obviously um, generating carbon emissions which then could be fed into our building. There's a hotel which needs hot water all the time. So the, the solar thermal effects and the abundance of hot water we generate can be shared with those adjacent buildings. So this is turning into a, an idea where a building becomes a system uh, in relation to the uh, adjacent buildings and that we can design for these systems. Very similar to the ecosystem that we always refer to as a model uh, which continuously transforms energy, which continuously grows, which has zero waste, but is always um, providing an environment for um, you know, a, a, a very diverse um, a population in, of species. And uh, traveling to Taiwan, I saw this uh, building where a, a traditional warehouse was um, um, populated by a fast-growing tree and forming a sort of hybrid of, of, a, of a technical structure and, and the plant and the entire roof was starting to turn into a set of, of roots replacing the original rafters um, uh, forming again a surface which then through the leaves would become actually a shelter in the, in the summer. So I'm, I'm, I wonder what there is at the interface of these technical and biological cycles and systems that would enable our environment and our buildings to become more adaptable and to react more with its environment. So I guess starting with materials meaning also ending with materials and not ending with materials but really follow through the idea of materials from the beginning to an end and after the end um, thinking about the next cycle and how, how to follow through the flow of materials in the value chain in, in your design. Thank you. <laughs>